Okay, good morning, afternoon. Um, as Ganola said, it's been a busy last few weeks. Um, so I'll admit I threw this together a bit more hastily than I normally would have. But, um, but um, at the end of it, I'll hope to convince you that uh, ecosystem services, though they are a bit of, a, of an abstract concept in a lot of ways, um, some parts of them are actually quite tangible and they do have very meaningful implications for policy and we're already seeing it in some of our work at the, well, in fisheries. We're in the same building, just one floor down. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll go briefly through, yeah. so I'll go briefly so, through some of the um, stuff that you already know. So market price doesn't always or almost never equals value. Um, and then go through a bit more of um, a case study example that I'll be drawing on for today, which is the case of forage fishes, so small-ish um, fish, not always fish, some squid species. Um, that form a really vital link of energy through the ecosystem and they have a really big impact. And then some of the work that's been done previously sort of drawing on this stuff from ecosystem services and some take home. So first of all, we all know that price doesn't equal value. So whereas the value of ecosystem services, we have stuff like provisioning, supporting services and bequests and you know, um, inspiration and cultural stuff, in the market usually all you're interested in is how much revenue is needed to offset your cost, right? And, Obviously, we can internalize a lot of this stuff into those costs, but mostly we don't. And you know that's pretty much true among most industries, but especially in fisheries, it's very rare that this, this sort of thing gets uh, internalized. So in the case of forage fish in particular, um, I won't say this is recent work, but there's been some recent efforts to kind of raise awareness on this issue. And they've used forage fishes, which as I said, are generally small fishes. Anyone? Pacific sardine, no? Thread herring, no, nobody? The Pacific anchovy? So these sort of fishes um, have a huge impact in the ecosystem because uh, essentially they're really abundant. Right? They're just you know, kind of cockroaches and when the climate's right, they just boom. Right? And so that creates a lot of downstream effects throughout the ecosystem. Uh -huh. So we've done some work trying to quantify that value, um, specifically looking at supporting services. So if you don't already know, supporting just being, in this case, the value of fish as food for other fish that we then fish. Okay, so it's still pretty, it's very tangible stuff still, and, and everyone that I've talked to can really understand that. And actually a lot of uh, older uh, fishermen or fishers that you talk to will say, oh, of course, we've known that about that for years. Why haven't you done you know, anything about it until now? So it's something that people really understand. and so. The market value, the way we're defining it, in this case, then becomes the landed value of these fish. Uh, landed value being um, whatever the fisher has paid at the dock for their fish. That's it's kind of like the first value of, of these outputs. And then their supporting service value, so the value of this fish as an input for other fisheries, right? And that will create its, its total market value. So you, you could wonder, well, how do you do that sort of thing? It sounds really complicated. And it is, it's funny, like 10 or 12 years ago it would have been a PhD thesis. Now it's like two weeks of work because we've developed all these you know, models and modeling platforms that essentially have always allowed us to do it. We just had never applied them in this way. So when you have um, ecosystem models, this one in particular is output from uh, the EcoPath, if you've heard it, family of models. that are called mass balance models. So in order to create this food web, uh, you actually have to specify how much each species eats of every other species, and so on. So if you think about it, you're already explicitly putting in what the supporting values of stuff. We just never put prices to it, right? which is what we're starting to do now. So in one such example, this is for um, California Sur, which is the southern part of Baja. Baja Peninsula is two states. Um, uh, you look, when you put real prices in there, so these are the actual reported landed value from these different species. Um, this would be the supporting service value. You realize that, oh, forage fish actually are really important, right? And the conclusion from this part is that ecosystem service values can dramatically change our perceptions on the contribution of these species to the economy, right? So this is really cool. You know, I think people really understand this, they get behind it. But the one added problem when you're gonna start to apply this to policy, especially in the, in the um, 
a case of forage fishes, is that they tend to go across boundaries. It's just kind of part of their biology. It's rare that you'll have a forage fish that is exclusively fished by one country, right? So if you're gonna draw any implications, right, they better matter to a host of different countries and to cooperative fishing strategies or else they just won't matter at all. So one particular case that's, that this has been looked at is Pacific Sardine in the California current, which runs um, sort of, it's part of the overall, you know, larger current, but it runs south uh, from BC towards uh, Baja, California, right? And so um, this is stuff that um, Gakushi Shimura did. He's an, a graduate from here a few years ago. And you can see these are just wild fluctuations in abundance, like I said. And for this particular species, when during warmer climate regimes, it increases its abundance and it expands its range, right? And it kind of shifts a bit northward all the way up into Canada. So I don't know if you remember, but I think two years ago and three years ago, there were huge landings of Pacific sardine off of this coast, right? And I actually worked on this with the, they quickly created the Pacific Sardine Association, we did a bunch of work for them, and then a year later they were all gone. And now it looks like they're coming back again, maybe. So you can see how variable this thing is. And in colder uh, climate regimes, it, it decreases abundance and it kind of shrinks or contracts the distribution uh, down sort of off the California Bight in northern Baja. So this is some of the work that uh, Gakushi Moore did and he modeled this sort of thing in a game theoretic model. Game theory being, if I do this, what's the other person gonna do? What happens if we cooperate? What happens if we don't cooperate? And essentially what he found was, don't mind all of the numbers, but some of them, whenever all three countries cooperated, the total payoff, and he only looked at sardine value, was much greater than if any single person decided not to cooperate. The problem was that whoever decided not to cooperate got way higher individual payoffs. Right? And so what he found was that when you look at this individual species, there just was no incentive for stable cooperation. So you could sort of create one through side payments, different arrangements, but it wouldn't hold up uh, by its own. Right? And, of, and the interesting thing about uh, Pacific sardine is that there actually is sort of a trinational sardine form that happens every year where people get together and they sort of float the idea of possibly cooperating, right? But it's never really happened uh, ever, I don't think. So another little side is that some of you know both of my parents are fish biologists, and so I actually got my start, my first pro work as a researcher on Pacific sardine when I was in like high school or something. So it's kind of neat to go full circle. Um, and to see how little beard I had. And I don't know why I even tried, but anyway. Um, so what we did now is going back to the ecosystem modeling part. So we know that sardine, there's no stable cooperation uh, if you only look at the species, but we know, also know that the species is actually much more valuable than the value of itself, right? And so we take three different models, well two, we use the same model for these two countries with different inputs, but same structure. Um, three different ecosystem models, um, and we essentially simulate what happens to the ecosystem, what would happen if climate was cold, climate was warm, people cooperated, people didn't cooperate. So just really briefly, we have, a, this is a climate-driven model, so we have three different temperature trends, and we chose it just best, uh, based on um, just historical trends and kind of projections from, from different sources on variation and et cetera. We have these different models and, and sardines abundance and distribution changes according to each temperature scenario. But now instead of just looking at the species itself, we actually use it as an input to the wider model. So we know what happens with everything else, right? And finally, the strategy, you have the players, Canada, US, Mexico. Um, and I'll, I'll take a minute to explain these strategies because it'll come up later. So we have full cooperation, pretty obvious. Everyone cooperates, they fish sustainably at maximum sustainable yield, which in fisheries is like the, you know, it used to be the end all be all. People say it's not, but it still is. And it essentially means what's the most you can fish while having a sustainable fishery, right? So it's like being conser conservative in your fishing, but still getting everything you can, right? Partial cooperation, two players, so either Canada, US, or Mexico, US, cooperate, fish sustainably. The other player fishes everything it can. It's actually not far from reality because a lot of these countries, when they can get sardine, they just try and fish it 
because it's going to be gone, right? Non-cooperative scenarios, nobody cooperates, but, there, but there's two different ways in which they decide not to cooperate. One is they take care of their resource when it's abundant. So I'll say this slowly because I even get confused on this. So if there's higher than 50% abundance of sardine in any given country, right, that country will fish sustainably, right? If there's less than 50% of the distribution in any country, that country will fish everything it can, right? Because it sees no incentive for conservation. It says, well, what's it to me if I fish it out? I have only this tiny portion of it. The second part, the windfall, similar. Nobody cooperates, but they only care when the resource is scarce. So this is probably a little bit more realistic. So if I have more than 50%, if the resource is abundant and the getting is good, you go get it, right? If, there, if it's not as abundant, you take care of it and you, you know, cry out and say, why is this happening? And put research into it and you know, shut the fisheries down. And the final E is no sardine fishing. So leave everything as food for the seals, of the, I would say for the salmon. For this case, it's food for everything else. And the payoffs, um, we go beyond looking at just a single species, right? Because we're interested in a lot more than that. So you have the average annual revenue, uh, the total discounted revenue. So it's the sum of everything at a three, I think, percent discount rate and the net present value. So this is taking into account the fishing cost, right, of, of the fishery. Sorry, Ten. correct, thanks. Did I have 20? Perfect. Yeah, yeah, no, okay. <laughs> okay, so you end up with a, with a climate-driven, multi-species, transboundary, game-theoretic resource model. Everything works, the cogs kind of feed into each other. And this is kind of the take home. So first of all, if you actually just plot sardine catch in the three countries, which is about as good as it gets for our data, against the catch of everything else, there seems to be some relationship there, right? So there is some empirical evidence supporting that theoretical relationship that I didn't come up with. It's been around for 20 years, uh, that there is a, 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 an impact of sardine abundance on the abundance of everything else in the ecosystem. And what we can do is distill that into simplified relationships using our ecosystem model. So this is the end result of all of them. So you increase sardine biomass in this particular case tenfold, well you get more of these fish, a bit less of these fish because of all the different trophic web interactions. Now this is really bad, I know, and uh, I had to, I racked my brain for like three weeks because there's so many variables and so don't mind this picture so much, I'm gonna focus on this one in the end, but what I do want to understand is this is the total and sardine annual landed value, so the yearly value, for each strategy. So this is like the cooperation, Mexico cheats, Canada cheats, nobody cooperates but they're conservative about it, nobody cooperates and they just don't care, and no sardine fishing, right? And so for each one of these columns, you have the total value, sardine value, and everything is relative to the overall mean for each climate scenario, the mean being zero, forget everything if I, I just said, if it's above the dotted line, it's good. If it's below the dotted line, it's bad, okay? So now we're gonna, it's really hard because everything's different units and anyway, I try like a million different ways to do this. It's probably not the best one or it, it was the best one, but it's still not good, so. Um, this is zooming in on the all scenarios. So this is across all climate scenarios that we tried and this is like, you know, you know how it is, like the millions or whatever, which doesn't matter, just put in a little number and let it run. Um, so what you find is, if you notice, these three scenarios are either cooperative or partially cooperative. And what we had seen before, the conclusion from looking at the single species, was that if you didn't have everyone cooperating, it would be bad, right? Nobody had an incentive to do stuff because you know, it just didn't work. In this case, what we find is that when at least two players cooperate, you still increase your economic performance, okay? Though it's, it's still better if everyone cooperates, right? And the reason this happens, sort of the underlying thing, is that sardine fisheries are also really valuable, right? So we said sardine are valuable for the people who are fishing them, they're also valuable as food, right? And so in this graph we have the total value of fisheries and the value of other fishery, so not sardine, on this y-axis, and then on this secondary y-axis, you have the value of the sardine fishery, 
right? So if what you find is, in order of great to good to bad, if you fish sardines sustainably, right, a little bit less than you would have normally if you were looking at the single species, it's the best because you don't run down your, the re, the, your abundance of the resource, right? So you don't run down the value of those other fisheries, but you still get the value from that sardine fishery, right? So your total is maximized. Whereas if you don't, start, if you don't fish sardine at, at all, this sardine value would be zero, right? And if you go back to this one, so this is sardine zero, and the total value is, is decreased because you're not fishing sardine, right? So the, the value of sardine as food is important, but it's not significant enough to offset not fishing it, right? I see people nodding, okay. Um, and finally, the worst thing you can do, and this is what's really interesting, um, is overfish sardine because you run down your resource, so you don't get your sardine, but you also run down the resource as food, so you don't get anything else, right? Everything else is also depressed. So that was a really interesting result. It kind of, you know, and I had no idea that was gonna happen, to be honest, so, but I was happy, which is kind of bad, right? Isn't like confirmation bias or something? But anyway, still happy. So finally take home, just to summarize, um, we see that ecosystem service values can dramatically change our perceptions of, of species value. Um, and even in highly studied fish, we often still focus on the single species, right, or, or the single fishery, right? Like as complex as we make it, we're, we're still kind of pretty tightly focused on this thing. Um, and so unlike those analyses, when you start integrating ecosystem service value, you have completely changed outcomes. Now it turns out that it would be good if you cooperated even if the other country won't. Right, so as long as two of you are doing it, you still win. And we just saw these. And so finally, the other question is, is that complexity worth the research expense? Right, so I would answer, is market value the only value? No, right, we've only just begun to touch on some of the value from this. Matt mentioned ecotourism, which is not even in here, which can be huge. Right, so before we can answer this question or, or get it as a doubt, we should start asking this one as a calendar. So thank you. That's it. Thanks, Kai. In southern Baja, in that fishery. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, uh, so it's, a, it's an equilibrium correlation. So basically, like feed in sardine to the ecosim model. And then just say, yeah, sure. Uh, which, this one? That one, right. Oh, this is just empirical data. But this is essentially what I did. No, 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 no. It's the same method, but no. So what I did was also use sort of a second order polynomial, but on the results from the ecosim models, right? So you would have a curve like this, where you have starting abundance, not catch, right? And the abundance of the other species at each level of sardine abundance in the simulation. And so each one, uh, so each one of these points is a year in the empirical data, right? But in the, in the correlations that I actually used, each point would be a combination between sardine abundance and the abundance of the other species at equilibrium. Yes, sir. Uh, well, they have the same shape, right? But they're all, I mean, like for example, these would be going up, obviously. These that are decreasing would be going kind of like that. Well, theoretically, in this empirical thing, it would be that there's less food in the system, right? So if you have less sardine, as evidenced by the fewer sardine catches, everything being equal, which is not, um, you would have less abundance of everything else, right? 
Sorry, is that what you're asking? Right, but that, that would be if it was if it was abundance, right? But if you think that fisheries if fisheries are constant or relatively constant, right, then less catch means they're less abundant, not that you fish less. Right? Because this is just empirical data. So nobody's trying to leave sardine in the system. The reason they're not catching it is because it's not there. Right? So there's a presumption there yeah. equal Exactly. Right. right. Which is which is wrong, but it's a presumption. Exactly, catch is a proxy for abundance. But in the actual runs, in the, in the later results, you actually use abundance directly in the model. Some of the groups don't do as well because, because, the tro because of the different trophic interactions. So for example, these elasmobranchs, which are sharks, some of them are actually like dogfish and smaller sharks. So as sardine increases its abundance, some of these larger fishes actually respond faster, and so they end up depressing the abundance of sharks. Right? So not everyone wins in these in these scenarios, which is, you know, it's realistic. Uh, so it was Hadi and then. Yeah, the Baja one, yeah. Uh, uh, no, sorry, that one, yeah. Right, which is, I mean, this is just a coincidence, right, that it's the same number. Sorry, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll write that one down. I have to defend this in like three weeks. So, <laughs> thanks. And sorry, Sean. The graph for the what? Yes. Why would the minus value choose to go back down? Because you're overfishing it. Right. So basically. So the price, so the no, no, you're just overfishing the resource. Right. So as you start fishing, if you, if you don't fish at all, you get zero landed value. Sure. Right. If you start fishing to the point where you equal the fastest population growth rate, you get your maximum sustainable sure. yield. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's yeah. Yeah. So pass that you overfishing, so you essentially ran down your resource. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this is the marginal yeah, value. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. Exactly. What we find in this one, though, is that their indirect value, while it's important, it actually doesn't outweigh their direct value in this particular case, right? which is also because in some other cases they've argued, I think, with a point that you just shouldn't fish them. It's just why would you? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, a while ago. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you could because um, while ecosim, it's like when you say it doesn't capture the shocks, like ecosim is not going to just come up with a shock by itself, right? It's just a model. But if you were to shock it with stuff and you see it in other models that we've done, so for, say, for example, you shock a system with no kelp, you're going to have lower recruitment, uh, probably higher juvenile mortality, right? But then you have the kelp opposite and you shock it, you'll see that not only are things more resilient, they're probably going to recover a lot faster. If, because they're just, yeah. yeah. Exactly, but you could. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right, right, right. So, so what Kai is saying is that um, EcoPath and EcoSim have they represent trophic dynamics, right? And if you want to capture dynamics that aren't trophic, so for example, what if, for example, what if sardines were just scared of anchovies and they just went away, right? You would have to specifically say that they're scared of anchovies for it to actually have a measurable effect. Yeah, you're right. So that's not in here yet, exactly. Go back to your climate scenarios. Climate scenarios. Mm. This is actually, um, for, in order to make the results comparable, I use the same scenarios that um, Ishimura did a few years ago. And so what we did was the, there were different uh, projections from NOAA, I believe, on what the California um, sea surface temperature was doing and what they expected that it might happen in different scenarios. So it's just an autocorrelated mean um, temperature per year. Right? And then you have one with the mean increasing with a lot of variation, another one with the decreasing, and that's just the average. That's a fair, and yeah. The other is, I know there's some aspects of what Kai is talking about, is whether, whether the dynamic uh, fishery production in the tropics, in La Nina and Nino, regional differences could be similar to the Nino framework that you have. They, they can, but they're not currently being so done. The Absolutely. The framework is actually Absolutely. Yeah, so the reason these are a bit wider, and it's something that um, Gakushi in, in his paper talked about, um, is because we're trying to exaggerate these scenarios. Right? If we say if, if temperature is only going to change you know, a few or not even a degree over this whole time span, you're not going to get much information. So you're trying to get as much contrast as you can. Right? Is this then reflected in the energetics of the fish and how much it is weighing it down? No, 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 no. Right? No. If you want to do it, do it properly. Yeah, I mean, Point taken, point taken. But, um, yeah, that would be another PhD, actually. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Well, not only that. I mean, a lot of the recruitment, um, the recruitment ratios that we've seen in sardine in particular, uh, appear to be driven by temperature, but it's nothing that we can really measure. We just know that, for some reason, this just affects completely the recruitment. or not migration, but movement. Etc. That's yeah. That's a really good point. I I had to stop somewhere, Hattie. I had to stop yeah, somewhere. <laughs> I, you know, actually, if I were you, I wouldn't show you. Fair enough. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Just say that there were temperature scenarios, warm, yeah, just, cold. Yeah, but if it's this graph that mm -hmm. sets off a long bell, so we don't have anything about time off. Fair enough. Thanks. Thank you.